afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a payment analysis we did in advance of a wind farm development in Corpus Christi. I'm going to talk about the project location, um, our traffic, existing versus proposed uh, payment analysis tools that we used, and the analysis and limitations of the two roads that we analyzed, State Highway 26 and FM 70. Overview, our project location is south of Corpus Christi. The two roads that were impacted by the, I guess, the, the wind farm development were State Highway 26 and FM 70, also known as Chapman Ranch. Um, of course, our main concern is traffic. So we did a traffic assessment. We did a seven-day classification study to obtain the existing volume and compare it to the development traffic volume. Um, as you know, heavy loads tend to damage the pavement more severely. Um, usually the payment damage caused by class one, two, and three is usually negligible. Motorcycles, cars, and pickup trucks, and most payment damage comes from a class four and higher. Um, as you can see here, the first table is our existing traffic. 80% of it is uh, class one, two, and three, which is usually negligible in terms of damage. And most of our damage is coming from a class five, which is uh, relatively small. Uh, if you look at the wind farm development traffic, it's a combination of concrete trucks, gravel trucks, controller trucks, and delivery trucks. And those range from class 7 to 13, uh, which are pretty pretty heavy. Um, so these are the payment analysis tools. We did a, a lot of laboratory testing. We did a lot of soils, base, hot mix testing. But what's important is, or to summarize it, the soil PI is pretty high. It's in the 50 range. And the flex base aggregate is pretty weak based on the wet ball mail. Did a lot of non-destructive testing. We ran GPR uh, to, to get the layer thicknesses and, and look for payment irregularities. We ran falling weight deflectometer to get the stiffness of the payment layers. Um, and we did a we ran DCP just to just to validate the FWD data. Uh, Stay Highway 26. Uh, this payment section was kind of unique because the inside wheel pad has a the base is a concrete payments lab, and the outside wheel pad is a eight inches of flex space, all of it overlaid with six inches of hot mix. So we had to do two FWD runs, one of the inside wheel pad, one of the outside wheel pad. Um, ran GPR to, to, to get a, uh, the payment layers, uh, drew some cores to get the hot mix quality, and we had to do a, a trench just to, just to find the limits of the concrete slab and measure the, the thickness of the base and hot mix. Um, before I, uh, we go over the fallen weight data, I'd like to show some typical modulate values. Um, the flex bay ranges from 40 to 70 KSI. Uh, concrete ranges from 2,000 to 7,000 KSI. A very good subgrade ranges from 16 to 20, and a very poor subgrade ranges from 2 to 4. This is the fallen weight data for uh, Stay Highway 26 on the inside wheel pad with the concrete slab. They're X axis is the, the length of the project in miles, your Y axis is your, your modulus. So the concrete slab is in pretty good shape. It's pretty uniform, uh, 2,500 KSI average. But your wind section is a little different. Um, your subgrade is pretty weak. As you can see, it's uh, in the 4 KSI range, which is pretty, pretty weak. Uh, and since our foundation is pretty weak, our flex base is pretty weak as well. Most of it is below the 40 KSI range. Uh, so what are your limitations? Uh, your subgrade is weak. Your axle load distribution between the concrete and the flex base could lead to failure of the wind section. And we ran a text track, so check uh, based on the 12,000 pound wheel load and, and the winding is not thick enough to provide protection for those heavy loads. This is our condition now. And this is the condition of that same road, which is north of the air in question. So this is potentially what could happen to the winding. Um, FM70. Your payment section is a little more uniform, 18 inches of flex space, three and a half inches of hot mix. Here are the roadway cores. Some of the hot mix is in decent shape and some of it has some moisture damage. Um, got 18 inches of flex space. And here's your subgrade modulus. Um, average, we have 11.5 KSI, which is pretty good for corpus. Um, your flex space is kind of all over the place. Most of it is within the 40 to 70 KSI range, some of it is pretty good, but as you can see, we have some weak spots below the 40 KSI range. Um, so what are our limitations? First of all, FM70 is a low uh, restricted highway, and um, these facilities are designed for wheel loads that are, uh, lighter wheel loads that are 
currently allowed by law. Your base is weak in some spots, which lead the failures by those heavy loads, and it's not thick enough. The tracks will check is asking for an extra couple of inches. Uh, we map those weak spots based on uh, flex space modulus. So here um, we have 3.3 miles with the uh, flex space modulus with less than 40 KSI. Those are represented by those red spots, but those red, red dots. Um, 2.4 miles of it has a modulus less than 30. 1.8 miles has a modulus less than 20. And about a mile has a modulus of less than 15, which is pretty much subgrade. So let's, let's talk about cost. Um, and this is just to make the road traversable. This is just to replace those, those failures with six inches of flex space and two inches of hot mix. As you can see, it can range from around 400,000 up to 1.4 million. So in conclusion, I mean, our limitations, you have insufficient pavement thickness to provide protection from those heavy loads. Your subgrade is weak and some, uh, on 26 and some sections in FM70 were identified with low strength on the base, which could lead to failures. Your alternatives for State Highway 26, the five inch structural overlay to meet the tracks will check, which is not feasible, it's too expensive, and plus the subgrade is weak, so it could fail anyway. Or you can move the loads along the center line within the limits of the concrete pavement, but you need traffic control and you impact the safety of the traveling public. And on FM70, you can do a two inch structural overlay that'll cost you 150,000 a mile. You can do some spot repairs, like we showed before. That could range from 400,000 to 1.4 million. Um, or you could negotiate a no donation agreement with the developer to, to address failures as they occur. So in summary, we did our visual evaluation. We documented the existing payment distress. Um, we round following weight to determine the road structurally sound and to identify weak spots. And what are our options? Await and assess the damage later, address those weak spots or, or place that structure overlay, or maybe we can negotiate a donation agreement to maintain the roadway during the development. And yeah, no, that's, that's all I have. Tom. Hey. Well, when Tom's changing this presentation, uh, Robert, thank you. Very good evaluation. Next up will be uh, Rex Costley, and he'll be talking a little bit about the donation agreement and negotiating with these wind farm developers. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to talk a little bit about our experience in the FAR district having to do with uh, wind farm development and some of the distress that uh, resulted in, in, the, in this development. Uh, basically, this is just an outline of what uh, I'm going to be going through uh, the presentation, uh, kind of focusing on some negotiations because it is uh, challenging, uh, you know, trying to get money from somebody else. So hindsight's 2020. If you take a look at the end of project and the beginning of project, you'll see that plant location. And uh, if you can uh, imagine a parallel line on 1847, five miles east and west, that's where the wind farms were. And so the uh, developer was basically using that roadway to and from for about eight months. So you can just imagine uh, the distress on that roadway. So we've had some planning activities, and the time frame basically is from February to March, and, and, and they came in to, to the district office requesting to use our roadway, and I was glad that they did take a look at the, at the sign in front that said a uh, load posted roadway of 58,000 pounds, because they were thinking that they could just basically use their legal load and some super heavies. So they presented, they had their financial portfolio, they had all their investors in line, their work schedules, Basically, they were ready to start the project. So it also showed critical milestones, and, and basically, uh, they were ready to work the following day. They just wanted TxDOT's approval uh, for, us to, for us to give them the, the green light. So I go back to TxDOT's uh, previous missions and goals as far as economic development and, and work with others, and that's going to be a reoccurring theme because you're going to find out that, that I guess the district was kind of put in a position that we really had to work with others, if, if you know what I mean. So all in all, uh, April through May, we were in general agreement that, that the utility owner could use our roadway. Uh, basically, they provided that at that time, the legal mechanism that we used was a highway crossing uh, agreement for damages occurred. So we set the bar pretty high, 
$400,000 a mile for reconstruction because we knew that that was going to happen. So they set a bond for $3.6 million. We got it executed. We also did our homework. We also did our pavement evaluation, and uh, we identified that that roadway had a remaining service life of about two years. So general understanding that the roadway repairs would be handled by the utility company, and um, highway agreement uh, working with maintenance division was secured, executed, and everything was uh, fine. So again, economic development and working with others. Sure. Okay, no problem. So even before the agreement was signed, there was uh, already rotary deficiencies uh, early on. Uh, Texas Cruz repaired uh, some of these roads with, and, you, and with a utility company trying to finalize a roadway contractor. Uh, the repaired uh, pavement section consisted of 15 inches of base and, and one inch of cold mix. So you're talking about in-house crews doing this work. It wasn't two inches of hot mix. It, it wasn't, you know, a, a, it was a throw and go per se just to get that road passable. So we also set up a damage claim through our compass maintenance management system to track labor, materials, and equipment. And this, this proved very vital of trying to recoup that cost. Again, through July through September, that's kind of where it got hot and heavy, where the, the, the damages were more extensive. Um, the subcontractors sub came in, the influx of super heavies, delivery trucks, um, Texas crews basically had to uh, blitz a various, uh, the area and had to pull resources from various maintenance sections just to keep that road passable. Long hours, 12-hour days, 14-hour days, just to get that road passable. Utility company uh, was not unsuccessful in securing the roadway contractor due to the high cost for repairs. It was very shocking to them on the cost of doing roadways or repairing roadways, so they kind of opted to uh, let TxDOT continue to do a good job for what they said. So they did say that they were going to pay for damages. They did say that uh, TxDOT is doing a wonderful job to continue the work. Again, so now we're forced with working with others. We're too much, we, we, we got skin in the game and we have to continue and, and, and ride this course out. So these are just some localized repairs or localized uh, uh, distressed areas of what the utility company and their, and their trucking industry did to our roadways. And you can kind of see it all over the place. It just, it just blows up that entire roadway. And that's the reason why it's load zone, because of that. It can't handle legal load. Um, you take a look at some edge failures, and once you lose your edge, you practically lose your roadway. And so this is just a recurring period over that nine-mile stretch, you know, 70% of that was basically like this. And you just see that throughout. It, it, kind, of, it kind of hurts a, a maintenance section supervisor, what others do to their roadway, and, and we're, we're called to action to repair it as best as we can. So this is kind of what we did. This is our in-house repair, and, and, and this great all operator, he's just, he's just magnificent and very talented in what he does. That is a very clean and tight box, and that's kind of what we do to, to keep that road back in passable condition. And then our blade man uh, puts a real tight uh, blade on it, inch to an inch and a half of cold mix, and, uh, and the road is passable. So that's, that's pride, even though that's, it's not a real nice seal coat or uh, an overlay, it was passable. So all in all, the roadway repairs, like I mentioned, it accounted for about 70% of the nine mile load zone roadway. We mobilized various crews from all over the district to hit that. Um, because in a maintenance section, we can't really dedicate 100% of our resources just to handle one roadway. There's other needs out there, as, as well you all know. So it was an eight-month duration, and the total bill was about $2 million. And this is a beauty of Compass, our maintenance management uh, system that basically captures all that cost. Just the material alone was about a $1 million of this limestone, and it was relatively cheap in our area. So taking into control, it, taking into into uh, concept traffic control, from equipment to lodging, basically the the burn rate was about two million dollars. So this is where it gets interesting. So now everything's all said and done, and and the utility company cuts their ribbons, and they're and they're getting energy for from the wind farm. Now they question the validity of the highway crossing agreement. They get their legal team, and they start questioning TxDOT's legal team. And that's where we, we consult the services of maintenance division and, and our legal team to kind of help out what we can do and try to reach a, a common goal. So again, the utility company really doesn't understand how TxDOT 
operates their business and how much it costs to, to reconstruct a roadway. So they throw us $500,000 to just put overlay on top of our cosmetic repairs. And, you know, it, it, that's not going to really address the issue. So there's two rounds of negotiation, and from November to, to September, they keep on telling us, well, they tell me, hey, the check's in the mail, don't worry, you're going to get your two million, you're going to get your two million, and, and you keep on thinking that it's going to come, and, and it doesn't come, so then they bring in some retired TxDOT uh, professionals for TxDOT to talk TxDOT, that type of lingo, because the utility company and their lawyers, they really couldn't understand why we were asking for them to pay two million dollars. So. All in all, we kind of uh, agreed to uh, $700,000 um, uh, damage because $700,000 equated to the cost to bring it back to existing conditions. The existing roadway conditions was about six inches of, of uh, gravel and about three inches of hot mix. So we kind of met in the middle, per se. That was justifiable for us. And I guess, you know, $700,000 is, is better than nothing at all. And then walking away with, with two parties. So lessons learned, I guess, you know, prior to the, the, to the donation agreement or the highway crossing agreement, basically you need to have some advanced uh, coordination up front. Um, you know, it's, it's okay to say no when they want to come in and do whatever they want to do. It's okay to say no because they need to understand our processes and our, and our limitations and our procedures. We also compiled a, a checklist to just kind of get a better understanding of what that project looks like. What is it going to entail? How long is it going to take? And then we also kind of uh, tell them, hey, you can use alternate roadways, like county roads, use their roads instead of ours. It's, you know, because, and, and I say this because in our area, we have county roads that are just, you know, caliche, they're limestone, and the commissioners are happy with just putting more asphalt on top of, exi or uh, a caliche on top of existing caliche. So, so it's kind of win-win for the county. And so we also want them to have them do the roadway repairs because it's a strain and a stress on our maintenance supervisors for us to do that. So during the agreement, during that process, you need to continue to work with others. You simply just can't say no. There's terms of being enablers, not regulators, but there's a fine line there too. Establish weekly drives um, and, and identify repair works. Uh, set, your, set your standard of what is acceptable and what's not acceptable and continual co uh, communication. Give them that burn rate of how much it's costing us to do that, that work for them. And then as far as the project closeout and the negotiation or the, is basically documented correspondence, all the emails, all the meetings, and then determine a middle ground. Going into this, you know you're not gonna be getting a lot of money. So you need to know how much it's gonna cost to do that rehab and focus on that. And that'll be your, your, your ground of, of not backing down on, on trying to get some of that money and then know that, that TxDOT is, is gonna pay for some of these costs. So if you know that that, that roadway, that nine mile stretch roadway was three and a half million, you're gonna put some of that money in and hope that that at fault party or that utility company, I should say, give some of that money back. So all in all, that's, that's kind of what I had. That's, that's, or I'm sorry, this is our checklist that we came in on, on, on uh, through this as a result of, of working with the utility company. And now we're doing with this donation agreement through this exercise, the highway crossing agreement is really no longer a, a viable document or mechanism to proceed with recouping up a cost from an at fault or a, a donor per se. And then the uh, donation agreement is the mechanism. And I just highlighted uh, the uh, agreement process, but uh, basically it's you really need to set down that money, get that money up front and, and work with it so that, that you can have some, some reassurance that you're gonna get some money back in return. And then here's your signatures. You'll find out that it's either the CEO and some, some top executives that are having to sign this contract. So that's what I've got, guys. Excellent presentation, Rex. Uh, next up, Cyril's going to tell us what's happening in the Permian Basin. All right. How's everybody doing? Still awake? And for those of the, for those of you in that TP and uh, TP and D arena, have you ever had that project that you leave off to the very end, seeing if you get funding or not? I'm that project. So uh, anyway, um, this was my presentation, 120 pages, but I'll go to this. <laughs> so anyway, no, 
what I want to talk about is just the, the trends of the oil prices in the Permian Basin, well, around the world, but also the funding, how it's changed in our district, the challenges that we've had in the district, and how we're uh, facing those challenges. So keep in mind with the prices of oil in the Permian Basin, so, so goes the economy and the traffic and, and safety. So in 2007, the price of oil began to, to rise. It, it went to about 100. In mid-2008, it reached near $150 a barrel. By the end of 2008, it was $30. In 2009, it again began to rise. And in 2010, it held steady for about four years, four to five years, at $75 to $100. And then the last couple of years, again, we, we took a dip. So with that, you know, the economy, like I said, the traffic went up and down. Uh, our funding lagged behind. We didn't really see any uh, increase in funding until 2013, fiscal year 2013. Uh, we had $37 million in, uh, million dollars in construction. In 2014, we had $67 million. In 2015, we had 85. In 2016, we had uh, 147 and last year we had 167 and this upcoming fiscal year we're programmed to let 228 million so as you can see we our trend is going up in the construction arena maintenance is still the same so we're challenged in that area so the other other challenges that we have are constructing under traffic we've historically done it under traffic but because of the rise in the oil field traffic, we're looking at building uh, sections half in half widths and um, doing it that way. From the maintenance funds, again, like I said, we're still holding there, so we're, we're challenged with trying to do mill and fills with the same budget we had you know, from 10 years ago. Employee turnover, again, that's, that's a very, I guess, sore subject for us because as soon as the oil field goes up, we lose our employees, CDL drivers making $25 an hour. We can't compete with those um, prices, I mean the wages. So we're looking at that and uh, trying to hire them as, as high as we can. The pavement designs, from the pavement designs, we're looking at completely doing, you know, a, a full uh, research and reanalysis. I see Jerry DeLine there is helping us in our district to kind of look over our payment designs to see how we can better accommodate all this traffic. We, uh, we have one wind site, wind site on Interstate 20, a way in motion, and we're looking to use portable to get a more representative uh, traffic analysis tool. So in my history with during the Odessa area, um, I've looked at what has affected the most, is, of course, is the traffic, but about 12 years ago, we went, we got away from the seven-year seal coat program cycle. So I say that that was a big impact on our roadways. Um, the other is, um, like I said, the, the payment designs and the traffic affecting that and how we could better represent what's, out, what's going out there. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll close it to see if any, any one of you have any questions.